Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 71. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Do you love vintage cars? Then go to CarsYeah.com and get a free copy of the fantastic Filler Up book. It's a full-color ebook filled with fuel filler fun with over 60 color photographs of vintage cars plus inspirational quotes from some of the most famous automotive enthusiasts of all time. Simply go to CarsYeah.com, click on the free book button on the homepage, and download your Filler Up book today. It's free at CarsYeah.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. Today, I'm very excited to introduce my special guest, D. Randy Riggs. Randy, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I've got on my six-way harness. It's all attached and tight, and I'm ready to keep the revs up. All right. I love keeping the revs up. D. Randy Riggs is an award-winning photojournalist and author with 42 years of publishing experience in the automotive and motorcycle fields. He's the former senior editor of Cycle World, editor-in-chief of Vet and Sports Car International magazines, and has been editor-in-chief of Vintage Motorsport magazine since 1997, one of my favorite publications. He's a member of the Society of Automotive Historians, the Motor Press Guild, the International Motor Press Association, the Western Automotive Journalists, and American Society of Media Photographers. Wow. Randy's award-winning book, Flat Out Racing, an insider's look at the world of stock cars, was published back in 1995. His automotive photography has appeared in hundreds of books and magazines. In his youth, Randy raced flat-track motorcycles and Formula Fords, and he began racing vintage cars in 1999. The car he most loves to race is his Porsche 935 K3. I'm jealous. So, Randy... I've told our listeners a little bit about you, so please take some time and share some more about your history, your career, your interests, and of course, your passion for automobiles and motorcycles. Well, uh, I'm a baby boomer. I'm the first part of the baby boom generation born right after the war in 1946, and I was fortunate enough to have a dad who was interested in automobiles, not necessarily in a hands-on way where he worked on his own cars but he wanted to buy the latest, fastest models he could get his hands on. There weren't too many of those kinds of cars around in that particular time frame. We had a couple of nice Cadillacs in the family. Uh, I came home from the hospital in a 41 Cadillac. Uh, (laughs) How cool. (laughs) Yeah, and after the war, cars were in short supply, and he wound up uh, talking uh, a dealer into Uh, selling him a 1949 Caddy Fastback, which became my mom's car. I remember at a very early age, uh, I was about four years old, three years old, standing in the front seat, and when she would, you know, come to a stop, she'd put her arm up to to hold (laughs) me from falling. You know, no uh, big deal car safety seats back then. Uh, That's how they did it then. Because of my dad's interest in cars, he would call out the names of cars as they were going down the street uh, as we were riding along. And uh, uh, the other thing I remember early in my childhood is, is he was a, a plumbing and heating contractor. He had a number of trucks on the road. He had about 15 trucks most of the time for his workers. Once in a while, he'd be driving one and put me in the right seat. I'd watch him shifting the floor shift and pushing in the clutch pedal and uh, stepping on the gas and lifting off the gas as he shifted gears. And in my mind, I was always trying to figure out what was taking place with the truck at that time, why he had to do that. And, of course, it was years, many years later when I learned to do that myself. But I think that's where I got it from, and I was an avid reader even as a, as a little kid, and my mom would buy me these little golden books. I still have one that I had as a kid, Tuffy the Truck, and uh, I love that story. Trucks were also an interest to me as a little kid, and I think the fact that I was an avid reader, about the time I was eight years old, my dad bought me my first car magazine, which I also still have. It looks a little rough around the edges, but it was a trend book called Cars of the World, 
and it had every car manufactured and from every country. It had it listed by country by country and the specifications. And what I noticed uh, years later in looking at it, I had the horsepower underlined with red pencil on, on every car. Uh-oh. <laughs> there it started. Yeah, it started then. It really did. And, you know, I remember years and years later, somebody said to me, a, a British uh, court, uh, writer of mine, he, he said, oh, I have a Dello. I bet you don't know what that is. And I said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> and it was in that that book or that magazine that I bought, you know, that my dad bought for me all those years ago. And I knew what a Dello was because I read that book, that magazine over and over again. Wow. My dad was a World War II Navy photographer. He was in the 117th Battalion of the Navy Seabees. He got sent to Hawaii for a number of months and then to the island of Saipan, uh, which they referred to as Island X. They were not allowed to call it Saipan in letters home. And it was right after the bloody battle when the Marines had uh, recaptured the island from the Japanese. In the interview, when he got there, they said, what do you do for a hobby? And he said, oh, I do photography. Well, my dad had had a dark, you know, dark room in the house, and that was his interest. He really wanted to be a commercial photographer, but he was making so much money as a plumber that he, he couldn't take the risk and, uh, and try commercial photography. In a way, that was unfortunate because I knew he really wanted to do that. But yeah. once they heard that, they built him his own Quonset hut, a huge dark room, and he became the battalion photographer. Wow. Uh, and, you know, gave him a big 4x5 speed graphic, a Kodak medalist, Kodak 35. And he got an assistant to process film in, his dark, in the dark room. Uh, he slept in his own Quonset hut. He didn't have to stay in the barracks. He was late for his first assignment. The company commander was really mad and said, this is never going to happen again because that's yours from now on. He pointed to his Jeep. The first week he drove around in the Jeep with CO on the windshield and everybody would stand and salute him, even <laughs> though he was an enlisted guy. <laughs> but when he came back from the war, he set up a dark room in the house and he said that when I was a little kid, you know, when I'd be maybe crying or cranky or whatever, he, if he was in the dark room, he'd bring me into the dark room, set me on his lap, and I'd shut up and watch the photos appear in the developer um, you know, when he was making black and white prints. I always loved the smell of, of, of the darkroom chemicals. And when I was old enough, he set me up with my own darkroom, gave me an adjustable 35-millimeter camera that you had to set the f-stop and shutter speed and a, and a little Weston light meter, and uh, taught me you know, how to use that stuff. And I started taking my own photos. And by junior high, I joined the photography club. My school had a photography club and a school newspaper. I think because I was a, an avid reader, I also liked writing. And uh, I was terrible at numbers. I hated math, didn't like arithmetic or any of that, that business. I was just drawn to the writing and the creative side of, uh, of things. I remember the thrill of seeing my first stories published in the school newspaper. And then later, the first thing I ever had published in a car magazine was in 1962. I wrote a letter to the editor, which they printed. And I remember getting the magazine out of the mailbox, walking in the house, kind of thumbing through it, and going into the letters to the editor section and seeing my letter. <laughs> and I was jumping up and down with excitement. You know, I was thrilled by that yeah. first uh, being published in a car magazine. Not that it was any big deal, but it, it meant a lot to me at the time. Of course. That's, that's how it kind of all got rolling, and, but I never thought about being in publishing as a profession, even though the guys like uh, Ray Brock, the editor of Hot Rod, and people that I read at uh, Car and Driver and Road and Track, I read all those magazines. I never thought about being one of those guys. When it really did hit me, was years later, about 1968, I was racing motorcycles, and I thought that maybe I would turn professional, and I, I wound up in my first professional year as an AMA novice, flat track and TT. You know, you, you win some money, and um, you think, you know, gee, that would be so exciting to go on the national circuit and race with these guys and all of that, but it, it's a very dangerous sport. The odds uh, went against me pretty pretty early on, and I got run over in a flat track race. I fell and got hit and broke my tibia and fibula really badly. At that point in time, I was working full-time, 
going to school, junior college, part-time, and, and racing. And I had a very full schedule. And all of a sudden, I have this broken leg. I had to go on disability. I was in a full leg cast. Luckily, I had an El Camino with an automatic transmission at the time, or I, would have been in, I wouldn't have been able to even drive. I yeah. thought, so, well, what am I going to do? And locally, there was a hobby shop that sold uh, rail, you know, model railroad trains, model cars, everything like that. And I, I had been a customer in there, and I went in there one day on my, my crutches, and then, you know, I said to the guy, oh, geez, I'm in a bad way. I'm on disability. I can't work, can't race. I, got, I had to get a roommate to help me pay my, my rent in the apartment. He said, gee, I need somebody here Christmas time to help me, and you know all about, you know, HO trains. And I said, well, yeah, sure, okay. So he said, you know, you can just sit behind the counter with your leg cast and <laughs> help people and, you know, run the register. and what. So that's what I did over the Christmas holiday. One day a guy walks in and he's the publisher of a, a local publisher of a magazine uh, company and they did a motorcycle magazine, and a, you know, model railroad magazine, I think uh, firearms, some other titles. And I uh, got to talking with him. He said, you know, I had I had weathered an HO boxcar, make make it look like it had been out in the weather, and, and uh, you know, it's part of the modeling process that mm-hmm. all railroaders do. And he said, gee, that's beautiful. He said, how did you do that? I said, well, you know, it takes some time, blah, blah, blah. And he said, boy, he said, I'd like to put a story like that in my, my model railroad magazine. And I said, well, I can do that. He said, well, how can you do that? I said, well, I know how to write, and I, I do photography. But lo and behold... I did a story on on weathering, you know, model railroad running stock. That was the first thing I ever really sold, uh, you know, got money for. I think it was about 50 bucks and mm-hmm. I was I was on my way. That was the moment <laughs> that I went I want to do this. Yeah. Yeah, how fa- that's that's fantastic and I love so many parts of that story of the the evolution of your passion and your skill sets and how in some way getting that broken leg led to being a publisher, a writer, a photojournalist, all those combined, right? Yeah, it, it's just how that happened. You know, the light bulb came on, and then I expanded that into motorcycle magazines because, you know, I was really an expert in that subject. Yeah. I, I thought, no, I, I, I'm going to race as an amateur for fun now and again, but I'll take the safer route and do enduros and, and that sort of thing. But my experience in racing... And the fact that I could do photography and, and write, when I started to freelance stories to the motorcycle magazines, uh, Cycle World, I wound up doing a lot of stories for. And they called me up one day and said, we have an opening on the staff. Would you be interested? And that's how I got my first staff. Oh, fantastic. And as we continue on your journey, I always like to start with a success quote, a saying that's been instrumental in forming your life and success and it's a really great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars, yeah? So, Randy, I usually say take the wheel, but in this case, take the handlebars. <laughs> um, I always think about follow your heart, but not necessarily with your wallet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wise advice. Yeah. In other words, you know, y- yes, it's really important to, f- to follow your heart. But you have to be a thinking person along that route. And, and uh, if your gut feel says yes, go with it. And if your gut feel is telling you, eh, I don't know about that, go with your gut feel. Always trust your gut feel. Oh, absolutely. And, and how have you incorporated that success quote, that thought process, into your business and your life? Well, I think I, I, anytime I'm doing anything where I get excited about something, I have to look at, well, here's the positive side of all of this. And here, this can be the negative side. And I look at the positives and the negatives, and I, I come up with, you know, draw a line and go, it has to be this way or this way. And because of how these all add up, this time I'm going to pass on that idea. Another time I might say, yeah, let's do this. Let's go. Sure. And, and then it's, you know, full throttle to the stops. Uh, <laughs> Keep the revs up, as you say. <laughs> yes. Yeah, do it right or don't do it at all. Yeah. Now, you talked about many moments in your life that you felt were part of instigating that passion for cars, but can you think of one moment in time that really instigated your passion for cars, and and tell us about that pivotal moment when you really knew you were a car guy or a motorcycle guy? 
I think when I I would borrow my mom's car at night before I had a driver's license and she would walk to a friend's house, I'd go in her her purse, get the keys out, quietly take the car around the neighborhood. We lived in a very rural area. There was little danger of a local uh, police force uh, seeing me. Um, I was a tall kid anyway, so I sat up high in the seat, <laughs> and I would have been about 12 years old when I did that. Yeah. 58 Chevy convertible, Impala convertible, <laughs> 348, 250 horse. <laughs> cool. Uh, white, white top, and uh, that vinyl sort of interior that 58 Chevys had. Yeah. And uh, But I didn't do crazy things. Crazy things, you know, uh, that you hear about kids doing, they take off with a car. I just drove around the neighborhood quietly, and not for too long, just enough to, uh, when I first pointed that car down the street, out, looking out the windshield with the steering wheel in my hands and the gas pedal under my foot, that was, I, I'm sure that was the moment. Now, was there ever a time down the road when you told your mom what you'd done? No, she knew about that. Uh, she used to look at her gas gauge and wondering what was what was happening, why her car was getting such a <laughs> gas mileage. That's and, funny. And, uh, I think the word finally got to her. and uh, But, you know, they, they had let me start backing the car out of the, the, the garage on weekends to wash it and pull it back in again, which yeah. was a really big deal. Oh, Little yeah. things like that. And... You know, at one point, my dad took me out on a job. He was doing the plumbing work on a, a new development in all the houses, and he had one of his trucks, and that was the first time I ever drove a stick shift. He, I was then big enough to look over the steering wheel, reach the pedals and everything, and yeah. said, you want to try this, bub? He doesn't have to ask me twice. Yeah. Well, Randy, I was going to say, what I want to do now is I want to take a look at some of the roads you've driven down and, and really crawl under the hood and get our hands a little dirty here. And have you share a moment in time where you had a huge challenge or even a great failure with your career, something that really pushed you to a breaking point, but more importantly, share with us how you overcame that situation and what you learned from it. There's a few things that I could talk about there. Uh, one was uh, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2004. A lot of uh, men my age uh, run into that problem. I was getting two physicals a year, one for vintage racing and one for the SCCA. And so I was being checked regularly for my, my PSA test. And my numbers had started climbing up. And my doctor said to me, you know, your number's gone over 4.0. And we get alarmed when the number reaches that. So I'm going to send you to the urologist. I had a biopsy, and, and they came back with, well, yes, you have prostate cancer. That's the bad news. The good news is it's the very non-aggressive kind, and uh, your, your numbers are the, the, the ones we like to see. Uh, so you have all the options of even not doing anything, watchful waiting. Um, so I, have, I, I vintage raced with a number of physicians and surgeons, and I started uh, t talking about the problem with them, and every one of them said to me, don't mess around with watchful waiting, get the surgery, take care of that, that prostate problem. Yeah. I looked into it further and had laparoscopic surgery, which is less invasive. It's mm -hmm. the Da Vinci method. The, the bottom line of the story w is that uh, the surgeon told me after the surgery that uh, you did the right thing because your cancer was very close to the margins. So, you know, we, we got it all. Here I am 10 years later with, uh, you know, the message to uh, my, in fact, I, I wrote an editorial about it in Vintage Motorsport Magazine. Guys, make sure you're getting that PSA checked. It's not a foolproof uh, test, but it's a very important thing for men to do. Prostate cancer kills a lot of people every year. I'm just glad that I, I did my research, uh, took care of it early, right away. Um, I was going to the to the doctor thanks to vintage racing and and racing. You have to get physicals, and uh, a lot of men, you know, that don't race, that don't have to get physicals, are like, oh, I don't need to go to the doctor. You know, I'm okay. That's not a good thing. No. Uh, so any men listening to me. Don't mess around. Uh, keep that PSA getting checked, and uh, 
I'm a survivor, and uh, I'm happy about that. Well, sure. I'm happy too, and I appreciate you sharing a very personal story with our listeners. It's so important. I've had several friends with that type of cancer, and thank goodness they've all uh, caught it early, and uh, they're still around here today. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Okay, let's shift gears here and go to the other end of the spectrum and share a story with us when you had a real aha moment in your career. A time when you realized that, you know what, I think I'm really going to make it at this publishing photojournalism game. And tell us the steps you took to turn that aha moment into your success. Again, I think that goes back to when I was freelancing and first selling those stories. The advantage I seemed to have at that time for publishers was that I was a writer and a photographer. And that meant that they could send one person to an event to cover it rather than two people. Um, you know, a writer and a photographer. That was a, that enabled me to to get more work. I, I made sure the work was was done well. I listened to what their needs were. Now, as an editor, you know, I appreciate what I did back then. Uh, I delivered the package that they wanted on time, never missed a deadline, and consequently, I got more work. That that was really the time when it all took you know took off for me. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Let's have a little fun here and talk about your first special car or your first car. Could you share a special memory, perhaps, that you had with that vehicle? My first car was an MGTF, 1955 MGTF. I was one of those guys torn between hot rods and sports cars. I I, I loved them all. But this MG was really special to me. I bought it for $700.00 at Hagee Sports Cars in Trenton, New Jersey, Mm -hmm. uh, which was a local place where you bought previously owned sports cars. And you could go in there at any given time and see a lot with uh, Morgans and MGs and Heelys and Jaguars. And I used to love to ride up there on my bicycle before I had a license and peruse a lot. I don't think my dad was thrilled with it. You know, most of the kids that were getting their licenses and buying cars at that point with my classmates we're getting 51 Fords and 52 Chevys, you know, $50 cars, $75 cars. But I had worked for my money mowing lawns, shoveling snow, um, working for my dad on weekends. I worked at a pharmacy stocking shelves on Saturdays. Any way I could make money because I, I wanted to buy a car. And I believe my parents helped me with a couple hundred dollars of that uh, purchase. And um, my dad looked the car over, thought it was pretty sound mechanically, and which it was. I was thrilled to death to have it. I was kind of the hot guy in high school because not a lot of kids had, had cars. Uh, the girls liked it, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. The adventure I had with this car was my dad uh, and, and mom were divorced at this point, and my mom was living in Maine. I was living in New Jersey with my dad. It's about a 12-hour drive to Maine. It was... Uh, Coming up on Thanksgiving weekend, I had some days off from high school, and I wanted to go up and see my mom and and go on this adventure in my MG. My dad was a bit reluctant about it, but he was most concerned with the weather reports that it was going to be uh, rainy and possibly snowing further north. He was getting kind of nervous about that. So the only thing I had to do to prepare the car was to take it I, it was in good mechanical shape, but I had to take it down to the local gas station to get the coolant changed. It was easier for me to have them do it than it was for me in my own garage because it was a big mess. And uh, I had them change the coolant, so I made sure that if it, we got freezing weather, I'd be okay. So I did all my homework. You know, car was ready to go. Last minute, my dad says, you're not going. The weather's supposed to be terrible. I don't want you up there in a snowstorm with that car, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and my heart was broken. And I had my heart set on this trip, you know, it was just the adventure of a lifetime. Yeah. And I planned it for months. So he said, unpack your suitcase and, you know, you're staying home. I made like I was stashing the suitcase, but instead I snuck out a side door of the house, rolled the MG down the hill, and started it out of earshot, and went on my way. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, <laughs> as uh, Murphy's Law, <laughs> uh-huh. um, I get up on the... Garden State Parkway, about 1.30 in the morning, rain pouring down like you wouldn't believe. The little wiper's trying to keep up. Not much traffic at all out at that hour. My temperature gauge starts pointing towards the hot side. 
I didn't trust the Smith temperature gauge, so I tapped it a few times thinking the needle would go back, you know, to normal. I'd never had heating trouble with the car. It's cold outside. It's raining. How could the car be possibly overheating? Well, the needle pegged. Pretty soon the engine misfires and quits. I coast over to the side, rain coming down like crazy. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, am I in big trouble? (laughs) What am I going to do? And I sit there for quite a while. I get out of the car, take off the radiator cap. You know, sure enough, there's coolant's all out of it, steaming. So I got a hubcap off and went down to the drainage ditch where there's lots of water and and kept trying to fill up the the radiator with the hubcap and try to restart the car, nothing doing. Got back in the car soaking wet. Pretty soon this car comes by and I see his brake lights come on and he stops and he backs up on the shoulder where I was. Guy gets out, he's got a rain hat on and and big old guy and he comes back and he says, what's the trouble? And I said, oh, you know, I told him what happened. And I said, no, my dad's going to kill me. I'm not supposed to be here. I wasn't supposed to go. (laughs) The whole story. He goes, well, he said, I live just a few miles away. I'll be happy to go get a tow chain come back and tell you to my house, you can stay overnight and my friend owns a sports car garage. And you can take a look at it, see what's wrong. And and so I don't want you to be out here all night. So I said, sure. So he sure enough comes back, hooks this chain around my bumper to his tow hook on the back of his Pontiac, tows me to his house, sends me up to the guest room. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I can't believe my good luck. And I wake up the next morning to the smell of bacon and eggs. Wow. The sun is out, and, you know, I, I was really tired, so I, I kind of overslept. I came downstairs, and he says, wow, good morning. He said, the car's already down at the garage. They've already got it taken care of. Oh, Nothing my gosh. Too, yeah. <laughs> I, it was like a, a, a fantasy. Um, he said, nothing too serious. He blew the head gasket. They figured out why the radiator leaked. They the little petcock on the bottom of the radiator, probably somebody forced it in the wrong direction because oh, of the thread. the guys who redid your coolant. Yes, exactly. And they cracked the brazing where the petcock was brazed to the bottom of the radiator, and it was just cracked enough to drip, drip, drip. Yeah. That's why it took so long for it to run out of uh, coolant and uh, overheat. So I had to get my mom to wire me in a Western Union 50 bucks to you know, pay the bill and be on my way to Maine. I didn't dare turn around at that point and go back because I wouldn't have been able to make my adventure and I still would have been in trouble. So I thought I might as well do the adventure and, and be in trouble when I get yeah. back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so the, the rest of the trip was uneventful. It was exciting. You know, I had a good Thanksgiving with my mom headed back south. And when I got home, my dad took the keys away for a month. Yep. That was my punishment. And it was like cutting a leg off because yeah. I had to walk to school and I'd sit there and look at the car that I wasn't able to drive. But my dad, you know, later years said, you know, as a parent, I was worried about your well-being. You know, I love you, and, you know, I wasn't going to let you go out on a night like that. Yeah. And now, I'm, as I'm older and understand, I've never had kids of my own, but I know exactly how he felt. I would have done the same exact thing. Of course. <laughs> what a great story. Thanks for sharing that. It's wonderful. How about seller's remorse? Is there a vehicle that you've let go and you really wish you'd have it back? Yes. I had seller's remorse. Um, I had a Morris Minor van oh, that cool. I that I bought, and this was down in Southern California. I lived in Laguna Beach. I was uh, dropping an ad off. I had an ad agency at the time. I was dropping an ad off at a car magazine. Um, as I go to the office there, I see this Morris Minor van for sale. I write down the phone number, and I walk into this fellow's office. Uh, in fact, uh, it's Paul Fanner, the, the publisher and owner of Racer Magazine today. Back then, he was uh, doing a different magazine. I said, gee, I found this Morris Miner up the street. I'm going to call the number. And he goes, oh, the guy that owns it is right next door. So he introduced me to the, to the fellow who was an book, automotive book publisher. He had too many British car projects going on. His wife said he had to sell one, and that was the one that was running. And he was very reluctant to sell it, but... He, he sold it to me, and I had it until I moved to the East Coast to take a publishing job back east. I reluctantly sold it to one of my vendors in my ad agency. He was one of those guys who said, if you ever want to sell your little truck, I'll buy it. And so I called him up. I didn't know what my garage situation was going to be back in, in New Jersey. 
and I had to move so many things. I thought, well, I better sell it. So I get back to New Jersey. I live out in the country on these little wonderful windy back roads where the truck would have been just so much at home. And it just killed me that I sold it. I just, every every time I'd go, <laughs> go for a ride, I'd say, well, why don't I have that little truck? <laughs> I just loved it. And yeah. 12 years go by. Now we're in 1994. I go over to my friend's house on a Saturday morning. He's got the new Hemmings on his coffee table. I just kind of pick it up, thumbing through it, talking to him. And I turn to the Morris Minor section just by accident. And I see 1967 Morris Minor van for sale with a 714 area code for the phone number, which is where I used to live. And there aren't many Morris Minor vans. Uh, they only brought in six in 1967. That was the last year they imported Morris Miners. Mm-hmm. I went, oh, my gosh, I think this is a chance that it's my old van. I called the number. It wasn't the guy I sold it to. Uh, I talked to him for a while. It wasn't the color that mine was. I told him, you know, he said to me, everybody that I, that calls about this truck wants to turn it into a street rod and put a Buick V6 in it and put windows in the side. And he says, I, I'm not going to sell it, them this vehicle. I don't want it to be chopped up like that. And I said, well, I had an original one. I loved it. I would never do that to one of these. Mine was green. And he goes, well, this was green once. I had the door panels off. And it was oh, green oh no, I see where you're going. <laughs> yeah, and he said, it's tan and maroon now, and it's got gold leaf lettering. And I said, well, what's the lettering saying? It says, airport graphics. And I go, oh, my oh. gosh. Hold it. To. <laughs> there it so, is. Yep, he said, hold on a second. And he came back, and he said, I have this box of paperwork for the trucker. Are you Randy Riggs? And I go, yep, that's me. He goes, oh, I'm so happy you want it back. Uh. He was nice enough. It was going to cost me $1,000 to ship it cross-country. He took $1,000 off the price because it was coming back to me. Nice. Basically, I send him a letter every once in a while with a recent photo of it saying, Basil is still in good hands. And I named him Basil after the character that John Cleese played in that British series uh, back in the 70s called Faulty Towers, which is hilarious if you've never seen it. (laughs) And um, so Basil um, came back. He's out in the garage right now and uh, never going to be sold out of the family. Uh, (laughs) What a great story. I love that. You got your car back. That's super. (laughs) Well, here's a fun question for you, Randy. If you were a car, what kind of car would you be and why? I'd be a Porsche 911 Coupe, and I'd want to be owned by me. (laughs) And why is that? Well, it's a car that's athletic, racy. It fits the owner like a glove. And if I'm the owner, um, I know I'm going to be well taken care of. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Some cars do. They just feel right, don't they? Yes, they do. Yes. Yeah. Well, the 911 has a special place in my heart as well. I've had Several of them, and I hope I always do have one in my garage. They're really, really fun cars. Okay, Randy, here's a favorite part of my talk. I call it the last lap. And since you're a racer, you know what that means. The white flag is out. We're nearing the end of the race. And this is where I fire off a series of questions, and you give our listeners some very quick blips of the throttle answers. So are you ready to go? Sure am. All right, here we go. What is the best automotive advice you've ever received? When I had my MGTF on MGA for sale at that same Hagee Sports Cars, it looked a lot more streamlined and uh, svelte than my TF, and I kind of had the hots for it. So I told my dad, I think I want to sell my car and, and buy this MGA. So he went down with me to look at it, and he looked it over, and he goes, no, you don't want this car. I don't like the way it looks mechanically. We even took it out. He didn't like it at all. And I think he, at the time, I was thinking, well, he just doesn't want me to sell my car and go through all the trouble of buying another car and all of that. But as it turned out, my one of my high school friends, older brother, wound up buying that car and had nothing but trouble with it. <laughs> always overheating. It was always broken down. I think he had electrical problems. It was the best advice I ever got. I have a really similar story. I really wanted to buy this Triumph TR4. And my father had a 47 MG TC when I was real little, and that was my kind of pivotal moment into cars. But I was quite young then, and I wanted that TR4 so bad. And my dad went and looked at it, and he said, Look, do you want a car that you have to work on all the time, or do you want a car that you can actually drive all the time? I ended, <laughs> I ended up buying a uh, 
Volkswagen Carmen Ghia, which was a great car, served me well all through high school and into college. And a friend of mine bought that TR4, and within six months, the engine was blown, and he ended up selling the whole thing for junk. So those, that advice we get from our fathers is often very, very good and advice. And that Carmen Ghia may still be running. Well, the Carmen Ghia got uh, destroyed by a drunk driver, the, you know, oh. the young woman who bought it from me. That's a whole other story. She's okay. She survived, thank goodness. But uh, that guy killed that car, unfortunately. I'm really sad to say. So it was my uh, my Ghia kid, my poor man's Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to have one again someday. Could you share one of your personal habits that you believe contributes to your success? I get up early every day, 5 a.m., I like an early start to the day. I like to put as many hours in the day as possible. I love it when it's around June 20th or the 21st and we have those long hours of daylight. Oh, yeah. I, I seem to get a lot done and I, I, I like the sunshine and, uh, you know, the daylight. So uh, as we get closer to winter, I miss I miss those long daylight hours. But I think getting up early every day and getting ready to get everything revved up uh, right away is how I how I approach everything. Uh, it's a great, great uh, habit to have. And you'd love living up here in the summertime because the sun starts coming up around 4.15, 4.20 in the morning, and it is glorious in the morning. However, in the dead of winter, I don't think we see the sun until 9 o'clock, it feels like, sometimes. <laughs> so uh, we get the big extremes. Do you have a resource that you'd like to share with our listeners, maybe a website that you frequent? You know, uh, my my favorite website is autoextremist.com, done by a gentleman named Peter DiLorenzo, and he really tells it like it is about the auto industry. Really enjoy looking at that, at that website every week. He re, it redoes it every Wednesday, I believe. Mm-hmm. Make sure uh, you know I connect with that. But I, I use the World Wide Web as a as a resource often. Back up my collection of automotive and motorcycle books. I have a very big library. I, you know, I turn around in my chair and grab books off the shelf every day to, to do fact checking for, for my stories in vintage motorsport and, you know, just in general research uh, if I'm writing a story myself. Sure. Well, that's a great segue to my next question. Is there a book that you recently read that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yes, it's uh, by John Morton, who was a fantastic uh, racer. He's still vintage races. Um, in fact, I've, I've run with him in some vintage races, uh, but he, he was a pro racer in Can-Am, and uh, he was uh, with, the, with the Shelby uh, organization early on, and that's, that's what the book is about, called Inside Shelby American. Wrenching oh, and Racing. yeah. That's a great yeah. book. Yeah. Yes. Wrenching and Racing with Carroll Shelby in the 1960s, and it was recently um, published I, when I started reading it, I couldn't put it down. I, I read it from cover to cover. Oh, it's a great book. Well, I'll remind our listeners that I will put all these resources on the website at carsyad.com slash Randy Riggs. That's R-I-G-G-S. And you can find links to all these resources there. Do you have any interesting hobbies outside of your passion for cars, Randy? Well, you know, in, with vintage, you know, I got into vintage racing because of the magazine. I've always been a believer. Uh, if you're an editor of an enthusiast publication, you should participate in whatever the subject happens to be. Um, in the case of vintage racing, I vintage race, and I was fortunate enough. Sid Silverman, who was the owner of this magazine for many years, had a fleet of 18 different race vintage race cars. Right after I took the job as the editor, I said to him, you know, I, I raced Formula Fords and I raced motorcycles uh, years back. I know about racing, and is there an opportunity I might have to try one of your cars because I'd really like to participate? I think it will make me a better editor for this magazine. And he, he didn't hesitate. He said, well, we're going to Coronado. You can drive the Allard J2X uh, Hemi, Hemi uh, Chrysler. Oh, wow. Uh, 1953. Well, I didn't know what I was in for. Uh, what a beast. Yes. You know, a fast, pretty fast car, uh, f- especially if you think about 1953. Brakes that go away after a couple of laps. Steering so heavy that even if you're in good shape at the end of a 20-minute race, your, your arms are just hanging at your sides. You can't even lift a glass of water. And a car that'll kill you in a heartbeat. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, trial by fire. Yes. 
um, I, I, I had a, a great race with a C-type Jaguar, of all things, and the door flew open on the driver's side. Of course, I'm belted in, but I was worried about the door slamming against the fender and what oh, have yeah. you. When I came in, I said to the guys who were taking care of the car, I said, why did this door fly open? He says, well, nobody's ever driven this car this hard. Oh. It's a whole space <laughs> like thing, and there's not much of a, a latch, and it just came open. Good and, for uh, you. That's awesome. <laughs> So, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, to drive, gosh, I don't know, 35 or 40 uh, very different types of race cars, uh, a number of Lister Jags, a couple of Lister Chevys, uh, Porsche 935 K3, Porsche 910, 908, wow. uh, 76 March Formula One car, Huffer Cugini, Jaguar E-Type, FIA 289 Cobra, uh, Birdcage Maserati, a number of NASCAR cars and five historic Indy Roadsters. Holy cow. The thrill for me was being able to go around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in a 50s era offy powered Indy Roadster. That oh. was for me, having grown up watching that kind of racing uh, and, and loving it, was the thrill of my uh, automotive career, I have to say that. Oh, my gosh. What a lucky guy you are. You know, your story sounds a little bit by, like Bert Levy, who's been on uh, Cars Yeah before and all the cars he's jumped into. So what fun you've had to vintage race in that many different cars. You are one lucky guy. I am. I am. I am. All right, Randy, we're up to the checkered flag, and being the racer you are, you know what that means. We're at the end of the race here. And this last question can be a real doozy for some people. If you could only have one collector car in your garage, and it's something you can't sell to buy a bunch of other cars with, and money's no object, I'm going to buy you whatever you want today, what would that vehicle be and why? Well, um, I, I'm going to have to say uh, for the street, a Porsche Carrera 2.7 RS uh, mm. with uh, blue trim and blue wheels. Ah, uh, the 73, and, right? Yeah, Grand Prix white. Yeah, uh. And uh, because I'm also a racer, I like to separate street cars from race cars. My race car would be, without a doubt, a uh, birdcage Maserati. The opportunity I had to run a birdcage was phenomenal. It's a car that is just so happy doing a four-wheel drift and a high-speed sweeper. A car is magic. It's just magic. If you compare it to modern-day, you know, uh, supercars or sports cars, certainly it's not as fast in a straight line, but the car, the beauty of it, the size of it, it's, it's very diminutive. It fit me beautifully, and the way it handles and stops is, is magic. It is just pure magic, and those cars won a lot of sprint races. They weren't ever successful in long-distance races because the chassis with all those little tiny tubes welded together was kind of fragile mm -hmm. and uh, if you broke one of those cracked one of those tubes where at the joints the handling started to go away so they dropped out of a lot of long distance races but those would be my two cars well i'll let you get away with picking two i normally don't do this but since you've raced so many different cars i'll uh, i'll be kind to you today normally i kind of press people to one but you pick two very beautiful cars wonderful cars i love the 73 rs that's one my bucket list and I've got a model sitting here on my desk, a CMC model of that Maserati birdcage, the white one. Uh, yeah. You have the blue stripes, and uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful. A lovely model. Yeah. Well, Randy, you've taken us on a great ride today, and, and I've really enjoyed your stories. What fun we've had, and I want to thank you for sharing your journey with me and with the Cars Yeah listeners. Could you give us one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset in one of those vehicles? Well, I, I would say... You know, if you're passionate about the world of cars, no matter which direction it may take you, if it's drag racing or road racing, uh, and vintage racing, modern racing, uh, follow your heart mm -hmm. uh, because this sport is full of so many wonderful, great people. The camaraderie is terrific. Uh, I, I have to say that among my circle of friends, I always look forward to you know, the car guys or the car girls because they're the most fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It is really about the people, although we talk about the cars all the time. It is about the people, the whole hobby. And would you let our listeners know what's the best way they can learn more about you 
and where you're working these days, and then we'll say goodbye. Well, if they go on the web and plug in Vintage Motorsport, that's Vintage Motorsport without an S, vintagemotorsport.com, they come to our website and they can see uh, the ways they can subscribe. We have an electronic version of the magazine as well as the printed magazine. We have a lot of great, great subjects on our website, videos, uh, a lot, a lot of material on the website, and that's the way they can find out all about Vintage Motorsport magazine. And do you have a Facebook page as well? We do. Okay, yes. great. Well, we'll we'll make sure that they can find links to everything you shared with us today again at carsyad.com slash Randy Riggs. And I'll tell you, I've been a long time subscriber to the publication, and it is fantastic. If you like vintage cars, vintage race cars, get your hands on that. Uh, maybe ask Santa Claus for one of those. Uh, subscriptions for Christmas, but it's a great publication. You guys do a super job there. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Randy, I want to thank you for being so generous with your time and your expertise today and sharing your stories with us. Until we talk again, I'll see you down the road. Keep the revs up. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!